Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm O'Connor Whiteley, bringing you psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. Here where I can find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and here where I can get your free 8 psychology book box set at ConnorWhiteley.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 171 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Con White D. And today's episode is on Could Borderline Personality Disorder Be an Adaptation? So this is a really brilliant podcast episode that I absolutely loved. And it sort of builds upon the focus of the Dyslexia Focus, the podcast episode, AFU, weeks ago, well, which is when we looked at is a dyslexia a cognitive strength in a sort of a disorder, and this one sort of like builds a upon this, because whilst the borderline personality disorder isn't something that we focused on too much on the podcast, in like a today's episode, we actually look at it in a lot more depth, and we actually see why this could have been useful in terms of human evolution. This is just such a brilliant podcast episode that I absolutely loved, and you all too. And it is the 23rd of September 2022 as I record this. So is a Friday. So moving on to psychology news section. We've written from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. Digest. And there's some really like, good ones here. So the first one is, This cognitive bias can push people into more extreme ideological positions. Numerous psychological studies have found that we seek out information that supports our pre-existing views and to those information that might contradict them. This is particularly true for politicised issues. For instance, people will choose to forego cash in order to avoid reading opposing news on topics like same-sex marriage and gun control. The implication of these studies is that the so-called selective exposure bias may be pushing us into more polarised positions. After all, if we ignore evidence that could contradict our beliefs, we may end up feeling even more strongly that our view is the correct one. Yet, as the authors of a new study in Psychonomic Bulletin and Review point out, even though plenty of research has shown that this bias exists, there hasn't, there hasn't actually been much work on how it affects our beliefs and behaviours. Now the researchers find that this bias can indeed shape people's beliefs in at least one area, their attitude towards diversity. So, but this is actually quite a like, good article though, and this is something that I actually find quite interesting because... I fully admit, I do not seek out opposing these on no purpose, but if I meet someone who has a, like, a opposing view, then I do at least, like, listen, and I, uh, and I do actually, like, take it in extremely rarely, and in fact, this has never happened, but I have never changed my point of view because of the, what they said. But I don't want to live in an echo chamber, and I don't want to um, not be aware of the issues and the other points of those that the people, that other people have, have, you know, have their life, no matter how wrong they are. So um, I think the real takeaway from this Psychology News article is just that... Uh, Definitely seek out like opposing those. Definitely learn like what they are because otherwise we all do risk of becoming ignorant. And personally, I think ignorance is such a dangerous thing. And it does help to combat this specific bias. So that's just something to bear in mind. So the second one is 
Expansive body poses don't always signal dominance. People rely the inner to bit of expansive poses with the arms and legs spread and the head held high as a signal of dominance or power. Well, that's how I began a post from a July of this year. And I think that's what we covered on the podcast because it was to do with black versus white uh, participants. That was based on a body of a research on power posing. But now a new study challenges the idea that expansive poses, those that take up the most physical space, invariably signal dominance. In fact, Patty Van Kabla at Duke University and her team report in Emotion that we take the most expansive poses of all that to signal something very indifferent in the deed. So I won't click on it and I won't go and talk about this in like any more depth, but if you did want to, then just go on the British Psychological Society Research Digest website. But there's actually only another point there, which is actually quite good to comment on. And this sort of thing does highlight the like complexities and the dynamics of like human behaviour and psychology like as a whole. Well, well, because tons of the research and the vast majority of the research may point to something meaning like one particular thing. For example, a expensive pose is it might suggest a dominance and a confidence. But then as so we challenge the ideas from like time to time though, like we may never learn that these things actually mean something else. Yeah, and to be honest, judging by the image like, that they have of an ecosensitive pose, I sort of take it as, uh, yeah, that doesn't mean like dominance to me. It means, I don't know, it just doesn't mean the dominance. So the final one is, women bear the brunt of unpaid labour and it may be affecting their mental health. We know that unpaid labour impacts millions of people across the world, and women tend to bear the brunt. In the UK alone, women carry out 60% more right, more unpaid work than men, spending more time on cooking, cleaning and childcare. What we know less about, however, is the impact this work has on people's mental health. A new review in The Lance Public Health by a team from the University of Melbourne explores the research conducted so far in this area. It finds that unpaid labour has a clear negative impact on women's mental health at the men's, suggesting that this gender divide could be causing serious problems for women. So I definitely don't think that this is a very surprising one, and I know that lots of people well, could take this as something along the lines of, oh yes, this is what we all have to do, because this is housework, and housework, domestic chores and everything have to get done by someone, and in our societies, these more traditionally have to be done by women, even though this is the 21st century, for goodness sake, it could be done by anyone. <laughs> but I think that the wider on this psychology news article is that we all will need to make sure that we do actually do self-care as, as part of our mental health so well, perhaps, and of course this is an unofficial tip, but, but if you do a lot of like, unpaid work, it will work though, but like for example, if you do lots of like childcare, housework, etc, then maybe talk to your partner, or like whoever you like, or whoever you live with, but just you reckon like, Work it out uh, just so it's like a bit more fairer and just that uh, you can have time for yourself just so when you're actually like relaxing and having fun because you will need to look after yourself before you can like, look after others. 
when I vastly pointed though without some people would had of this like unpaid work help. Some I hope you enjoy the psychology news section, some let's move on to the personal update. Now we're moving on to the personal update. This week has definitely been a very busy year and with a tons of the different little bits and pieces and a lot of different projects. But the two main things though is that for basically the first time in two years I've actually gone down to university to actually be a university student. So, so that was actually quite interesting. Because even though it was like freshers week, on the Tuesday I had some outreach work I could to do like as a student and ambassador. So I was meeting and like having lunch with one of the new student ambassadors. That was like really fun though and it was like really interesting to actually see like see my student ambassador mentor again and see the brand new faces. Because I was on a placement year last year all the student ambassadors that I knew, they've graduated and they've moved on, though, which was a bit of a shame, though. Well, but there were so many, but there were so many like newer faces, so it'd be really good to like get to know them all and actually work with them more, like well, over the coming year. <laughs> and then, like Thursday, I like, what well, I had to my EEG training. That's like that was good. And I really am uh, looking forward to using it on my final year project. But in uh, the afternoon, because something that I was originally doing uh, got cancelled, I decided to go to a welcome back for final year students uh, talk. And it was the first time in two years I've been in a lecture theatre. And it felt so weird. I mean... I didn't expect it to feel weird, but me going back into a lecture theatre and being almost like a proper student again, after COVID, after my placement year, after so much, it felt really, really weird though. But it was like nice, and uh, because I saw one of the girls who I'm doing my funny year project with, um, she actually invited me to like sit with her friends over there. So it was really nice to actually be here with people. Yeah, well, like talk to them and actually just like get back into the swing of like university life though. So the next year should be interesting and I really am uh, looking forward to it all now. And and I guess in a way I was a bit nervous about this year. To be honest, I still am. <laughs> but I think that like, it'd be good though. <laughs> and as always, I always like, love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So, you can always email me, connorwiley, connorwiley.net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at connorwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci fi wiley. I always love to hear from all of you because it really helps make the pod- podcast feel more like a conversation. And because I've really got to start adding this, like, um, in there to that little bit though. And you can also. Leave a comment on the Facebook post at Connor Whiteley site a ecology offer on Facebook. Yeah, I've really got so I mentioned that. <laughs> and today's episode has been sponsored by Personality Site Ecology. And this is the perfect sponsor for today's episode. Because whilst this is um, really easy to understand, but it doesn't actually go into mental health con and to personality disorders but that's something I am looking to add to the second edition which will not be out till at least 2024-2025 but a personality psychology and individual differences that goes into a wide range of personality psychology topics for example what is a personality how is it measured what are the biological and the cognitive and even the neural causes, that's like the brain causes, of a personality. Because a personality isn't just a like biological thing though, because it does in and over so many other greater topics and the great facets. And then in the second half, and then like towards the end of the book, it also goes into a, um, a lot more depth about 
How does personality actually affect our behaviour? For example, how does our personality affect our political beliefs? And how does it also affect our beliefs about like religion? And uh, very interestingly, and something that I was quite surprised about, is that how does our personality affect our beliefs about climate change and our attitudes towards veganism? So that was very, very interesting to like read about them. So I really do recommend this great, really easy to understand book. So that's Personality Psychology and individual differences available from all major ebook retailers and you can get the payback and hardback version from Amazon at your local bookstore or local library if you request it. But if you didn't want to buy a book but you still wanted to give the podcast a bit like one time support then you can have buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash con whitely and what um, buying me coffees and buying books um, allows me uh, to do uh, is that it effectively pays off for my time in uh, producing the uh, the uh, podcast, editing it, uploading it, and writing the uh, blog post. Uh, because it all does take quite a bit of time. So right now the personal update is done. Let's get on with the content part of uh, today's episode. It's such a great episode today. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be looking at Could Borderline Personality Disorder Be an Adaptation? This is such a great episode in in my opinion because what we're effectively doing is that we're returning to the idea of looking past the dysfunctional and the disorder aspects of mental health conditions like we did in the episode titled Why Dyslexia is a a Cognitive Strength, Not a Disorder. So in today's podcast episode, we're going to be looking at the argument and uh, the evidence for why borderline personality disorder is not effectively a mental health condition, but it can actually be an adaptation. But at the end, I do go back and comment on that, it's still a mental health condition, it's just not a disorder. So let's dive into today's episode. How has borderline personality disorder traditionally been seen? Whenever borderline personality disorder is spoken about, it is often seen as a brain dysfunction, with borderline personality disorder being described as a disorder related to interpersonal relationships due to people people with borderline personality disorder traits often have chaotic and unstable relationships causing the sufferer to rapidly switch from valuing a person to devaluing them completely without much notice if any in addition borderline personality disorder is uh, associated with the sufferer being hypersensitive to rejection, having a difficulty in controlling their emotions and their mistrustful of others. As well as uh, the condition uh, tends to have a a positive outcome in in the end because the symptoms of the condition tend to gradually decrease around a person's midlife and there are plenty of psychological treatments designed to help people with borderline personality disorder. However, the reason why I'm writing this introductory section is because the mainstream research in that the condition often sees a borderline personality disorder as something that is caused by a brain dysfunction, with one leading theory proposing that borderline personality disorder is caused by a frontal lobe deficiency. This impacts a person's impost control. Nonetheless, there is a new argument forming in the literature of a borderline personality disorder because there is increasing evidence and argument that the condition is not caused by a dysfunction but instead caused by an adaptation 
that has helped the person to survive. So, well, what is this new argument? And most importantly, what does it mean for borderline's personality disorder? Why is borderline personality disorder seen as an adaptation? The main supporter and author working on the argument for borderline personality disorder as an adaptation comes from Martin Buell, who is a professor of psychiatry at Run University Brocham and a psychiatrist at LWL University Hospital. The professor has previously written a lot on evolutionary psychiatry and this is a field that proposes we need to think about mental health and mental health conditions in terms of the big evolutionary picture as the conditions and adaptations that have allowed our species to survive. Therefore, whilst other professionals see mental health conditions as a pathology, they see the conditions as adaptations. Personally, I do want to jump in here quickly and mention something. I do want to flat out point out that yes, it is very modern and helpful to move away from the every single mental health condition is a problem mindset that is flawed and I'll recover the damage that this um, cause is on the podcast before. However, not every single behaviour is down to evolution. But it is an interesting a subfield of our behaviour. But is it necessarily correct? Because like everything in psychology and human behaviour, everything is caused by a range of factors and not all of those factors include evolution. So just bear that in mind. Additionally, Brun 2016 based the idea of a borderline personality disorder being an adaptation on the original work of John Boland and his work about the early about the early in life child development of an internal working model of the world. And in short, this is a mental picture that tells them what the world is like and how to survive as well as thrive in the world. Therefore, to some children, they see the world as an essentially friendly place with plenty of resources for them to enjoy. They also see the world as a place where interpersonal relationships are durable and great, and the child can expect their emotional and material needs to be met long into the future, and Bodhi believe children with a stable attachment are more likely to develop this sort of internal working model. On the other hand, to some children, the world is a hostile and extremely unpredictable place, with their attachments being fragile and fleeting by the very nature, and there is absolutely no guarantee of resources for them. These are resources in include emotional support, and material resources, resulting in Bowley to believe that these children don't tend to have stable earlier attachment, and at the extreme end of the spectrum, these children can and do experience neglect, abuse, and a wide range of other traumas. These are children are most likely to develop this sort of internal working model. As a result, now we know the child development aspect of the adaptation model, we need to connect it to borderline personality disorder. As a result, children who develop the second type of working model could and would behave very differently to the first type of children, since these children could mistrust others and they might they could be hyper vigilant in protecting them, themselves from a rejection and abandonment, as well as they could have lower expectations about access to future resources. 
This might cause the child to have more of an all or nothing approach to life, which we as outsiders might see as them being impulsive or reckless. In other words, the second type of internal working model might cause them cause them cause them to develop the traits of a borderline personality disorder, and it's that focus on the traits, not the condition, that you need to bear in mind here. Although it is worth mentioning and mentioning that Brun himself doesn't believe that borderline personality disorder is in itself an adaptation. He sees it as an extreme and maybe maladaptive version of the adaptation. But it doesn't matter what we or he see borderline personality disorder traits as an adaptation as an adaptation or not, the most important thing is that his argument forces us to consider the potential value that these traits have, or the value that they give a child in their formative years. Personally, this is what I like about these more modern uh, clinical psychology episodes, because they really do help us to question the status quo of the mental health and it helps us to realise that maybe the outlook and the negativity of the past is a horrific thing that does need to be sectioned to the past, so moving forward we can make our thinking more modern and hopefully towards mental health conditions like borderline personality disorder. Evidence for this adaptionist model as the psychology is a science, we must always focus on the evidence, and thankfully there is a good amount of evidence for this adaptationist model. For example, we know that abuse, neglect and other trauma are all were risk factors for borderline personality disorder, and up to 80% of our people with the condition have reported these types of adverse childhood egg experiences. This supports the adaptionist model because it shows uh, that a high amount of the children uh, could have developed the second type of internal working model and borderline personality disorder traits could have helped them to survive in their formative years. Furthermore, Borderline personality disorder affects up to 6% of the general population, and the condition does have, a, does have a genetic factors, as well as, as I've mentioned pre, on previous podcast episodes, how war evolution tends to wipe out most genetic disorders and flaws, so that they affect a tiny percentage of the population, and come on. 6%, that's not tiny. Less than 1%, that is very tiny. But 6%, I really don't think it is. And I think you can agree with me. So, if the borderline personality disorder is so bad for us, then why didn't natural selection get rid of it from our genetic makeup? Finally, people with borderline personality disorder have a high level of emotional empathy, meaning that they can read other people's emotions very well. Therefore, this could be seen as an adaptation, as it allows them to navigate relationships and intimacy better than people who don't have high levels of emotional empathy. Conclusion To wrap up today's podcast episode, if the borderline personality disorder is in fact an adaptation and not a disorder, then a lot of our language we commonly use after the condition is extremely damaging, misleading and just flat out false. And like most clinical psychologists, I completely agree that this is extremely troubling, considering all the negativity surrounding Mental health conditions only leads to stigmatising people with these conditions. 
and whilst I have mentioned it on other podcast episodes, but there is support and evidence for this sort of of thinking in other mental health con editions. For example, Hans and All, 2012, a um, preprint, suggests that at the very least, that depression is a coherent response to the problems in a person's life, rather than a disease in its own right. Therefore, all of this does I beg the very simple question, could the same be true for borderline personality disorder? And if that's true, then how many other mental health conditions could this be a true for? Personally, I really hope that it is true, but from a wide range of other conditions, so what we can seriously start to move away from the damaging, unhelpful and stigmatising mental illness models from the last century, but without more research, we simply cannot know for sure. The future will definitely be interesting. So, I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. I know that I did. I really do absolutely love these sort of podcast episodes. And if you know someone who will enjoy today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the words I hear about the podcast. And definitely check out Personality Psychology and Individual Differences, available in all the usual places. But if you didn't want to buy a book, then you can have Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash con wisely. So have a great day everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. And if you want a free Ada book psychology box set, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.